Hey, everybody. <laughs> Just thought we'd get in here and uh, have a little discussion about the spinal cord. I think the spinal cord chapter is one of those chapters where um, if you're not careful, you probably wind up skipping right over it, not really paying it much, much attention. Usually when you have a spinal cord lecture in someone's anatomy and physiology class, the lecture notes are not very in-depth. It's pretty short and sweet and to the point. And that's because compared to the brain, um, the spinal cord doesn't deal with higher level functioning. Whereas like the brain is responsible for processing incoming information and sending out motor commands and, and I mean processing memories, uh, handling autonomic functions such as the digestive system, the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, urinary system, dealing with particular types of reflexes, uh, specifically autonomic reflexes, uh, dealing with cognitive thought, um, spatial analysis, touch, taste, you know, uh, all, all that deep stuff that the brain can get into, literally. I mean, no, I, I could get all scientific and everything, but there's no need. We're trying to keep this simple and we're making it plain. So, you know, your brain deals with that, but your spinal cord doesn't deal with any of that. Yes, your your spinal cord does, spinal cord, I said corn, your spinal cord does process incoming information and manages to send out certain motor commands. But we need to get down to the details of exactly what all of that is. Now, now there's two things you got to remember about the spinal cord. Hands down. Don't ever forget this. Thing number one about the spinal cord is that it is, it is an information elevator. All right? It's an information elevator. Now, I seriously doubt that you're going to take an anatomy and physiology class and that one of the questions is going to have an answer that, it, that says that it's an information elevator. It's probably not going to happen. But it's a concept that I want you to get down. It's an information elevator because you've got to ask yourself the question, how does a lot of this information get to the brain and how does it get from the brain to the structures in the body? Well, it uses an elevator, just like if you stay on the 17th floor in a very large apartment building, then obviously, other than, other than taking stairs, um, you probably take the elevator. And that elevator allows you to go up to your apartment and come back down. Um, so when the brain wants to send information out, information has to come out and down. It has to descend the spinal cord and branch out through spinal nerves to go to whatever effector that motor command wants to go to. On the flip side of that, if sensory information wants to come in, that sensory information will come in through a spinal nerve, hop on the ascending track, or an ascending track of the spinal cord, and then rise up the spinal cord to the brain just like an elevator. That's why I called the spinal cord. I said one of the key things you have to remember about the spinal cord is that it, it is an information elevator. It does not process this information to tell you specific details about the incoming information. It doesn't do that. That's not the job of the spinal cord. That is the job of your brain. However, the information needs to be able to get to the brain in some shape, form, or fashion, and that's why it hops a ride through the ascending tracks of the spinal cord. And if information is trying to get down from your brain to the rest of your body, then it goes down descending tracks of the spinal cord. And a track, when I keep saying a track, all a track is, a track actually has a lot in common with a nerve. Because if you don't know what a track and a nerve are, they're almost essentially the same thing. They're one big bundle of axons. That's, that's it. And um, if you think about it this way, the axon is a part of a neuron, which is a nerve cell. So let's keep on backing up and backing up. You got your, your nervous system is made up of neurons. Neurons send signals. Neuron, neural signals leave the cell body and they, they travel on axons. Uh, the axons carry these signals to wherever their destination point may be. It may be another neuron or it may be some type of effector cell. Either way, 
signals travel on, on axons of neurons. If you take a bundle of these axons and put them together outside of the central nervous system, outside of the brain and the spinal cord, then we call them nerves. But if you take those same bundle of axons and put them inside the central nervous system, inside a spinal cord, inside a brain, we no longer call them nerves, we call them tracks. So first key concept is the fact that your spinal cord is an information elevator. And the other thing about spinal cords is that they deal with reflexes. And we might get a chance to talk about that in this video just a bit talk a little bit about reflexes and the importance of reflexes to us and we need to talk about a reflex arc because there's some very simple simplistic concepts behind a reflex arc not really deep at all we're not we're going to debunk a lot of mysterious uh, terminology but not. we'll be able to knock that out no problem so let me go ahead and uh, pull up these notes and I'll switch the screen share on this and uh, let you be able to see what what we got going on and I want to go to uh, the spinal cord notes and I want to start on this slide and I have a little we're not going to go through a whole lot of slides actually today and so I've got to be careful that I um, keep this on the up and up now um, I want to go backwards just a bit I'm I'm too far ahead let's go back to slide four and what I want to show you is, I'm going to blow this up just for a minute. And what I want to show you right now is I want to show you figure 14.4, uh, which is kind of a, um, a, a uh, horizontal shot of the spinal cord. What we're seeing over here is we're seeing where the spinal cord, we're seeing a, um, or, a horizontal view of the spinal cord. We've cut the spinal cord and we're looking straight down into it. So we have more of a superior view, and we're looking at the roots coming out of the spinal cord, and when the roots merge, they form spinal nerves. Now, let's, let's, I'm going to be talking to you during this video like you have taken some of this anatomy before. I'm going to review a little bit of it so I can, I hope, to kind of bridge the gap. But if you have some problems with understanding the anatomy of the spinal cord, just let me know, okay? Because, uh, you know, on second thought, let me cover some of the basics of the anatomy of the spinal cord because you never want to assume. Here's the deal with the spinal cord. Your spinal cord, the average adult spinal cord is anywhere between 12 and 15 inches long, which if you go find a friend of yours and you look at their back and you start counting inches on their back, you're going to notice that your back um, is a lot longer than 12 to 15 inches. Now, I mean, if you're a person who's re relatively shorter in stature, like let's say you're only 4'10 or 4'11, um, then 12 to 15 inches is a lot. So you'll be more on the shorter side. You'll be closer to 12 inches. But you take somebody like myself, I'm about, I'm almost 6'6. So 12 to 15 inches is not a lot of distance on me. Your spinal cord is naturally that short due to the fact that the rest of that distance that's being covered in your back is just a big bundle of nerves actually. So the spinal cord ends at about 12 to 15 inches and then it continues on with nothing but a big giant bundle of nerves commonly referred to as a cauda equina because it looks like a horse's tail. Cauda meaning towards the tail, towards the end. Equina coming from equine meaning horse, horse's tail. Looks like a horse's tail with a big bundle of nerves. So we took the spinal cord here, we, we, we split it in half, we're looking straight down from a superior view directly into the spinal cord and you see these weird things coming out that seem to merge, let's see if I can get my arrow back here, they seem to merge right here at this point and the reason why is because all of your spinal nerves, there's like 31 pairs of spinal nerves in your back, they are all what we call mixed nerves and they're mixed nerves because they contain sensory and motor axons. So a spinal nerve is a mixed nerve. It, it, it doesn't just carry sensory information. It doesn't just carry motor information. It actually carries both. If you don't understand what I mean by sensory and motor, then you need to go back and you need to brush up on your terminology because, uh, oops, press that button too quick, because sensory is always incoming information from the outside 
uh, you know, external or internal environment. And motor information is always information coming in from the coming in, coming out from the central nervous system out towards effectors. So you have sensory info coming in, motor information coming out. They can go in and come out through the same nerve because this same nerve has two different groups of axons here and two gr different groups of axons here. These two groups are both sensory. These two groups are both motor. They all flow through the same spinal nerve and that incoming information, that sensory information travels, it splits and it goes through this uh, dorsal root, also known as the posterior root. Notice it has sensory under there to tell you that this is all incoming sensory information coming into the spinal cord. And then motor information comes out through the anterior root, also known as the ventral root. And all of this information is motor. And that motor information comes out through this root and then goes into its appropriate spinal nerve. Um, so you got to keep that in your head first and foremost. I got incoming sensory information going here. I got outgoing motor information going out there. Now, this is what typically happens. Um, I'm gonna use I'm gonna use a uh, an old story for an example. I used to have a cat, and my cat had some weird uh, habits. One habit was that he loved to play with thumbtacks. I don't know. Go figure. He was a nut. So. He used to love to play with thumbtacks, and he would take the thumbtacks and he'd toss them around the room, and he'd carry them around in his mouth and run around with them. I, he just got a kick out of that. Well, one day, um, I saw him playing with like two or three thumbtacks, and I didn't think really much of it because he liked to put his little toys away, whatever he was playing with. He'd put it away, hide it somewhere. Well, late one night, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was thirsty, and I thought to myself, you know what? I made two pitchers of strawberry lemonade, and I think I'm going to go in the kitchen and go get some of that strawberry lemonade. And in order to get to the kitchen, you had to pass through the living room. And as I was walking through the living room, my foot hit something sharp, and I realized that that knucklehead had been playing with those thumbtacks in the living room, and he left them in the carpet, and I stepped on one. And man, let me tell you, that was... Mm, out some pain. So what happened in that moment was that thumbtack pressed into my skin on the bottom of my foot. Immediately, pain receptors in my foot receptors were stimulated and they sent signals through sensory neurons, specifically somatic sensory neurons, because this was a stimulus from the external environment of my body. Had this been a thumbtack that was pressing against my stomach on the inside, that would have been visceral sensory information. But this was me stepping on something, so that was somatic sensory information. And then uh, that somatic sensory information came in through uh, the somatic sensory neurons, up through a spinal nerve, then through this posterior root or this dorsal root, and then it entered into my spinal cord. Now, what happens next is absolutely fascinating. When it gets into my spinal cord, my spinal cord does a very low-level processing of the information. It's not going to process the information to tell me what it was. It just wants to see if this stimuli is going to supersede a particular threshold. If it supersedes a particular threshold, which this information came into my somatic sensory nuclei. All right. Um, let me pause for a minute before I go any further. Understand that nuclei are nothing more than uh, two or more, uh, you know, you, when you take a nucleus and you put a group of nuclei together, you take a nucleus and then another nucleus, and you put more nucleus in an area. We no longer refer to them as nucleuses or whatever. That's not even a real word. But we don't put a whole, we don't call it that. Instead, we call it nuclei. Nuclei is a large group of cell bodies that process information. Uh, 
So anytime I hear the word nuclei, I automatically know that is a place where cell bodies of, of neurons process information. We're going to come up with a solution here probably. So um, they process incoming information so that incoming stimuli or stimulus from uh, the pain receptors in my foot, they get that information gets processed in my somatic sensory nuclei. Now they don't tell me what it is I just stepped on. That's not confirmed here. We don't know that I stepped on a thumbtack. That is not known. But we have reached a threshold that warrants an emergency response. That's what happens. These guys are stimulated to a place where they feel that they have reached a threshold that warrants a response. And so now, if you look back over here, you'll notice that this little light blue guy, which is a neuron, he runs all the way over to these somatic motor neurons. As a matter of fact, he synapses. He'll synapse on these guys. He literally synapses. Oh, I lost my arrow. He literally synapses on these somatic motor neurons, while one neuron here bends back, and he's going to synapse on some interneurons. Now, what are interneurons? Interneurons are neurons who spend primarily the majority of their space, time, and life in the central nervous system. They don't have a part of them that goes outside of the spinal cord or a part of them that goes outside of the brain. They are primarily in the spinal cord and primarily in the brain. And this is what's happening. When I stepped on that thumbtack, notice that this thing splits right here. It synapses on two individual neurons. The first neuron here, right here, he's going to, it synapses on this first neuron. He winds up synapsing on somatic motor neurons. Notice, it skipped any, any frame of conscious thought. It skipped all that. There is no thought happening in this process right here. No thought. None. There's no higher order functions. No thought. That synapse, that signal gets passed right along with this middleman. It synapses on the somatic motor neurons. You send a motor command through these somatic neurons, through this anterior root or ventral root. It leaves through the spinal nerve, and it goes right back in the same direction where my stimulus came from. So because I stepped on a thumbtack with my right foot, that signal, that motor command, travels down nerves into my right leg, which causes my leg to jerk back away from the thumbtack. We call that a reflex. That is a reflex. A reflex is an automatic response. It's an automatic motor response to a stimulus. In this case, it's an involuntary response using voluntary effectors. Now let that just set in for a minute. That'll mess your head up, especially if you've been taking nervous system tests and whatnot in this. And then some guy gets on Google Plus and tells you, hey, yeah, you know, a reflex is uh, when you have an a involuntary response utilizing vo normally voluntarily controlled effectors. Yeah. Yeah, I just went there. It's one of the only times that you're going to see this happen in your body where the somatic uh, nervous system gets involved by an automatic process. Meanwhile, that signal, when it synapsed on this original neuron who started all of this, there was a second synapse. That's this second neuron. And the second neuron synapses on interneurons who their axons create tracks. Remember me talking about that earlier? Right. So that interneuron or those interneurons, they create ascending tracks, and the signal is sent up to my brain so that my brain can process this information. So when my brain starts processing that information, uh, that's when I start thinking about what it was that I actually stepped on. That's when my body actually, my brain really starts to think, and it says, wait a minute. That was sharp like a tack. Gee whiz, I wonder where that tack came from. 
oh yeah, that's right. Mr. Fuzzy Bottoms was playing with attack. Just wait till I find that silly cat. Me and him are going to have words, blah, blah, blah. All right. Have you ever noticed that if you touch something and you burn yourself, or you touch something and you stick yourself, have you ever noticed that you actually didn't realize, you didn't realize what occurred until after the action? Yeah, that's because that second neuron, this dude, this dude right here, that's because the second neuron was too busy synapsing on an interneuron and sending the signal up an ascending track to your brain so your brain could consciously and subconsciously um, debunk the myth and process that incoming information. Meanwhile, this first neuron already synapsed on these somatic motor neurons and went ahead and sent a motor command out through your spinal nerve so that you could create a reflex. Amazing, but true. Now, you might say, all right, that, that's great, that's wonderful, that, that explains a lot, but uh, yo, what's all this other stuff? Well, if the information, if the incoming sensory information is from the external environment, like, you know, something stung you on your elbow or something like that, then this is somatic sensory nuclei. That's, that's who's going to process the incoming sensory information. But if that information was coming from your internal organs, then it will be visceral sensory nuclei who would process that information. And if I needed to move my leg in response to something to make a reflex, I would use somatic motor nuclei. But if this was a reflex like, say, your small intestine responding to incoming food from the stomach, then that would be autonomic motor nuclei. Okay. Good. Now, let's skip well ahead some key things I wanted to show you. Here's an example. Once again, this is slide 11. This is an example with this lady. And, um, you know, I wanted to talk trash about her burning her hand because she's got the spoon in that hand, and she's got her hand going toward this hot cauldron of gravy over here. But then again, dude, you never know what's going to happen. Um, I wound up accidentally touching a basting, uh, uh, actually it was a lasagna pla platter, and the lasagna platter had been in the oven at about 425 degrees for about an hour and 15 minutes, and my hand accidentally brushed against that thing, and buddy, let, let me tell you, that was some pain. So that pain, that signal, now, now here's the thing, I need to say this, and don't get mad at me when I say this. Your finger does not know what's going on. All right? Your finger feels nothing. Your the receptors in your finger responded to a stimulus and then they send those signals through your sensory pathways up through your arm into your spinal cord and then it rides up the spinal cord through the brain stem and then up to this middle portion of your brain where your uh, thalamus happens to be and the thalamus relays that sensory information up to the cerebral cortex where it's then processed and then once the cerebral co cortex processes this information that ascended up the sensory pathways then a motor command is then sent through motor pathways down from the brain descending through a upper motor neuron and then synapsing onto a lower motor neuron that leaves the brain stem and then passes down to the muscles in the limb that wind up um, being impacted by that stimulus which is this limb and then this muscle contracts and then it jerks your arm and hand away. That's why Sometimes they, when they run tests on people for neurological disorders, they'll tap your right arm. And in the moment that you tap your right arm, your right arm should jerk. Some people have these disorders where you tap the right arm and the left arm jerks. And that tells us that there's something wrong. If I tap your right arm, your right arm should jerk back away from me. Not tap your right arm and just continues to hang there and the left arm kind of jumps and says, yo, what's good? You know, what's going on? 
that's not what's supposed to happen. So when we look at this picture, what we're seeing is we're seeing the neurons who are actually involved in the process. And you'll notice that in the sensory pathways, you have three neurons that are um, that are involved in the process. You have a primary sensory, secondary sensory, and a tertiary sensory. The primary, the job of the primary sensory neuron is he's actually located outside the central nervous system and his job is actually to get the sensory information to the spinal cord. So what he does is he rides all the way up and then he um, has a portion of his body because um, that primary sensory neuron, if you saw his shape, he's not shaped like a stereotypical neuron, not in the least bit. Uh, his cell body sits off to the side, and his axon is more continuous. It's it's almost like the axon and the dendrite are almost one and the same. And the cell body sits off on the side, somewhere in the middle. So incoming sensory information rides up the primary sensory neuron, and then it uh, it, it has its cell body, a group of cell bodies there in the dorsal root or the posterior root. This creates what's called a ganglion. So if you've ever heard of a ganglion, that's a group of cell bodies outside the central nervous system. A group of cell bodies inside the central nervous system is known as nuclei. Yeah, that's where that word came from. So a group of cell bodies in the central nervous system is a nuclei. A group of cell bodies outside the central nervous system is ganglion. Um, if you take several ganglions and put them together, then it makes ganglia. So you have a, a dorsal root ganglion that's sitting here. And then what winds up happening is that primary sensory neuron who brought the sensory information to the spinal cord it synapses on the secondary sensory neuron, and the job of the secondary sensory neuron is to take that, that sensory information straight up the brain stem and straight to the thalamus. The thalamus is the relay station for all, not all, almost all sensory, incoming sensory information. Um, I started to say all, but it's not all because your olfactory senses don't use the thalamus. And not initially. They, instead, incoming information from your nose actually skips straight to your brain. But um, the secondary sensory neuron runs all the way up to the thalamus, and then the thalamus, um, that, that secondary sensory neuron synapses on the tertiary sensory neuron, who then in turn takes that sensory information straight up to the cortex in which it needs to go to. And now it's up to that cortex to process the information and process everything that's happened and then come up with a response. Meanwhile, if you do come up with a response, it's created up there in that, uh, in that primary motor cortex. And that primary motor cortex sends a signal down the upper motor neuron, which it travels all the way from the upper portion of your brain all the way through um, the midbrain and the brain stem it synapses there in the spinal cord and it synapses on the lower motor neuron and the lower motor neuron passes through the anterior uh, root also known as the ventral root and it takes those motor signals straight to muscle uh, voluntary effectors takes it straight to the muscle in the same limb that was affected by the stimulus. And then it, it helps to adjust the body to the stimulus by drawing the body away from the stimulus. Let's see what else we got here. Okay, so we kind of talked about that. I, I, I started to go to this slide to kind of talk about this, but we, we've already talked about what we need to know from it. So I'm not gonna bore you with that anymore. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on ahead and talk about reflexes. Uh, reflexes, you know, when you talk about reflexes, let me see. No, I don't have the slide in here that I thought I did. When you talk about reflexes, one of the things you got to know about it is this basic definition that the textbook talks about, which is a reflex is a rapid pre-programmed involuntary reaction of a muscle or a gland. Basically, you have this reflex that is pre-programmed, uh, preset, it's already there, it's ready to respond to a particular stimulus. The example they give there is touching a burner on a hot stove. You know, 
they should have said touch a burner on a or a live burner on a stove or touch a burner on a hot stove because you just touch a burner on the stove ain't nothing gonna happen but I cut that sucker on yeah you, something's gonna happen basically if you put your hand on something hot the first thing that's gonna happen in a normal person is you're gonna draw your hand and your arm back in a person with an abnormal disorder they're going to touch fire and they're going to extend their hand further into the fire now, I know you might be thinking oh my gosh that's crazy that's nuts but they test stuff like this in babies all the time they come in with a baby for a checkup you got your eight month old and the doctor will take a little uh, forcep and they'll rub it on the bottom of that baby's foot that baby should draw their foot back away from the forcep if you take that cold metal forcep and start running it along the bottom of the baby's foot and the baby extends their foot outward so that it can push into the metal pre, um, forcep we've got a problem they're having abnormal reflexes reflexes are pre-programmed they're automatic they're they're involuntary you don't even think about reflexes I was talking to a group of state troopers at an at a particular fundraiser and I asked the the state troopers I said what's the most common accidents or what's the most common way that you see people getting into accidents these days and they looked at one another and they laughed and they said you want to know the most common they said reflexes they said you've got this guy who's in the middle lane he's driving the speed limit minding his own business and all of a sudden this person merges onto the interstate from his right and they are still merging like they've merged into their lane and they're coming over into his lane as he sees his car about to merge into him his reflex is to pull his steering wheel so that he can move away from that car little does he realize that there's a car in the left lane the fast lane that's getting ready to pass him and that guy in the middle lane jerks his steering wheel into the car coming through the left lane they sideswipe one another they spin they hit a wall they have an accident so uh, what's happening is you're responding to a stimulus you're responding to something that you saw reflexes are, are pretty normal most people have normal reflexes and they happen without your consent oftentimes it is a very rapid response very quick we do not contain many neurons in this process we leave as many middlemen out of this process as possible so we have minimal synaptic delay because every for every neuron that you add to a process that's a whole nother group of synapses you have gotta add in there and those synapses whether electrical or chemical must then function we have pre-programmed responses you know they're gonna happen the same way every time it doesn't matter if I uh, if I tickle your foot your foot's gonna jerk if uh, I tickle your foot tomorrow your foot's gonna jerk doesn't matter it's gonna happen the same way every time and reflexes are involuntary responses you know you don't really have a uh, you know a pre -plan, not a pre plan you really don't have time to really think about how you're gonna respond you just do unfortunately that that is something that firefighters and police officers and military personnel and um, uh, emergency medical response people they have to keep that all in mind and they have to train a lot of hours to be able to to you know work beyond that initial desire to just have a reflex because if you're not careful you'll have a reflex at the wrong time and jeopardize someone's life now let's go to one of the last things that I want to talk about in this video and that is actually slide 30 where we look at a simple reflex arc nothing deep nothing major really simple in a reflex arc there are five things in a reflex arc five really simple really easy five things in a reflex arc thing number one you have to have a stimulus you are not going to have a reflex without a stimulus that's why if you have an effector that is responding and there's no there's no stimulus involved that is a disorder and we need to get down to the bottom of what's going on you should never have a effector responding 
and there's no stimulus involved. So in order to have a reflex arc, number one, you got to have a stimulus. Uh, the next thing that you got to have is you got to have a sensory neuron. That sensory neuron is going to be what's going to carry the uh, the signal that's been created by the receptor to let you know that there is a stimulus nearby. Then the third thing that you need is you need to have that nerve signal processed. And basically, uh, it's going to be processed by interneurons, which, of course, as we know, interneurons are located primarily inside the spinal cord and inside the brain. So these interneurons process this information. Now, this is low-level processing. These interneurons in your spinal cord are not going to figure out exactly what type of nail that was that hit you, whether it was galvanized. Um, it's not going to try to remind you of when you had your tetanus shot. It, no, it's not going to do any of that. It's not going to think at all. All it's going to want to do is send out a response through number four, through a motor neuron that's going to go to number five, an effector, where the effector can respond the attempt to remove you from the stimulus. That is a simple reflex arc. There is nothing else to it. If you do anything to damage this reflex arc, then that's when we got problems. That's why earlier in the notes when you read, you'll read about these things called dermatomes. Dermatomes are very important because they are marked areas of our body that are being maintained and uh, monitored by specific um, spinal nerves. So when we have a certain area of our body where um, we're not, we don't have any feeling. So like let's say that uh, the doctor takes his or her fingers and they run your, their fingers along the side of your, your stomach and you don't feel that. You cannot feel their fingers there. They take a cold forceps, they run across the same area and you have no feeling of that whatsoever. You don't know if they're touching you or not. In that case, they may look at your spinal nerves and they may see where there's a curvature, you know, a curvature, a lateral curvature in your spine. And when they find that, they may also find that that lateral curvature in the spine is pinching down on a spinal nerve, henceforth the name pinched nerve. The the spinal cord is 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 misaligned. It's got a lateral curvature in it. It's pinching down on its spinal nerve. And so what's happening is signals are being produced by number one. The stimulus is activating the receptor. That doctor running their fingers on the side of your body, that is creating a stimulus. The stimulus is there. The problem is that the stimulus is traveling through number two, through the spinal neuron. And when it gets to the very end of that spinal nerve, the, because of the lateral curvature in the spinal cord, in the spinal column, the vertebrae that the spinal cord is in, the vertebrae bend over and they pinch down on that root, therefore not allowing those sensory signals to pass through and into the spinal cord so that your, your body can adjust accordingly. So the signals are not making it through, um, into and through the posterior or dorsal root. Therefore, it's not getting to the rest of the spinal cord. It's not getting to the interneurons. And so none of that information can actually be sent and processed at the brain level or the spinal cord level. So therefore, no motor command is sent out through the motor, uh, through, through those motor fibers out through the ventral root or anterior root and nothing sent to the effector. And so the effector does not respond. All right. Well, that's a that's a short and sweet and to the point on that. The only other thing we had to talk about were uh, these types of reflexes. You have um, ipsilateral reflex arcs, which basically that's just when you know what the word ipsilateral means. Ipsilateral means same side. So both the receptor and the effector organs are on the same side of the spinal cord. In other words, if I touch something really hot with my right hand, then my right hand and my right arm should jerk back away from the stimulus. Where contralateral means contradictory, opposite sides. So contralateral reflexes means that the sensory, come, sensory impulses or the stimulus comes in from a receptor on one side of the spinal cord but you wind up um, having an effector on the opposite side, like step on the object with a left foot. If I step on an object 
with my left foot, then my right leg is going to try to help me maintain balance while I withdraw the left leg. Which this is great because this is exactly what happened to me when I stepped on that thumbtack that the cat left in, sitting there on the rug. When I stepped on that thumbtack with my right foot, I automatically sent an ipsilateral reflex signal um, to my right leg to cause my right leg to draw back from the thumbtack. But at the same time, in order for me to be able to balance like that, I had to send a contralateral reflex uh, signal to my left leg to tell it to strengthen up greatly and to give me stability while I was jerking back my right leg. Also, you can have a monosynaptic reflex, which is like uber sense simple. I mean, all, all you have in a monosynaptic reflex is usually when you only have one synapse involved. And that's when you have a sensory uh, axon that synapsed directly on the motor neuron that was involved. Remember the picture of the spinal cord that we just saw a little while ago? And you know you had an interneuron in between the sensory and the motor neurons? Well, in a monosynaptic reflex, you don't have that interneuron in between there. You just have a sensory neuron synapsing directly on, um, directly on the motor neuron. Um, and, and that's a lot of times you see that happen when you um, go to the doctor and they take the little mallet and they tap you on your kneecap. And when they tap you on your knee, you'll see your knee jerk. That's a monosynaptic reflex. You've also got a polysynaptic reflex. And with a polysynaptic reflex, this is when you, it's a lot more complex. You have two or more synapses involved. Um, this is where we saw the picture earlier um, where it had a sensory neuron synapsing on an interneuron and an interneuron synapsing on a um, motor um, neuron. And so when you have that, you can have multiple synapses involved, therefore creating a polysynaptic uh, reflex. Usually this is when sensory information goes to the spinal cord. The spinal cord winds up sending, sending out uh, motor commands outward toward effectors while at the same time sending this incoming sensory information up to the brain. Okay, um, that's all we got for right now. Um, that's all we got for right now. Uh, I know that we're going to talk a little more about some of these other different types of reflexes like withdrawal reflexes and stretch reflexes. But that's really all we're going to get into. We're going to keep it short and sweet and to your point. To the point, if you got any other questions, let me know. Aside from that, uh, we'll definitely get back to you at a later date, we'll be talking about the difference between the autonomic nervous system and the somatic motor nervous system. Remember that with the autonomic nervous system, uh, autonomic is dealing with things that are automatic. The somatic nervous system is dealing with more voluntary substances, um, more conscious control. Typically in anatomy and physiology, we talk about the somatic division. We're typically talking about um, skeletal muscle. But with autonomic, autonomic is something that you spend probably an entire semester dealing with when you get into the urinary system, reproductive system, um, endocrine system, respiratory system, cardiovascular system, digestive system, things like that. Because in those systems, they require the autonomic division due to the fact that these are structures that are automatic. They're, they're internal, they're visceral. We're, we're dealing with functions that you don't even deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and you very rarely even think about them. The autonomic division is div uh, or system is divided into two different divisions, um, sympathetic and parasympathetic, whereas sympathetic deals with fight or flight and parasympathetic deals with rest and repose. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So with all that being said and done, we'll holler at you later. Peace.